explain something about our your money that you have paid on this tour. Ah, uh, it is. We do. Mosquitoes. People are complaining to me about mosquitoes. Uh, some people want a uh, mosquito repellent. These mosquitoes cannot be repelled. <laughs> <laughs> They've been here before you, they know all the tricks. They are Egyptians. And an Egyptian mosquito has to be treated with delicacy. You, when he comes, you say, hello, mosquito. And then you let him have his portion of blood. That's all he wants, some blood. If some of you blood is so bad, it will kill the damn thing anyhow. So let him have his blood. Because if his wife comes, she'll kill you. So let them have the blood, carry it home and shake with the family. <laughs> Stay indoors if you don't want to be bitten <laughs> with, the sh with the shades closed and a mosquito wouldn't eat you too much. Uh, so the general reason of repentance, you put it on what I'm trying to say, people buy those things. It may work with uh, uh, one of the most timid American mosquitoes, but they go work with the African mosquito. He's not really thrown off with this stupid amount of repellent. <laughs> he got ways to deal with that. Okay. We have journeyed from the United States. That's where the Japanese did to us. Everyone ran. And did that we, as far as I heard, and one physical journey from America. And myself being here. And what we have come really to do is sojourn in time and history. Every one of us here is connected to this place one way or another. We are either connected to this place by our heritage to religion our heritage to birth, our heritage to uh, descendancy or something. But one way or the other, we are connected to this land. And what we are going to find out is to what extent that heritage was. Why are we so hopped up on the Nile Valley and Egypt in particular? What does it hold for us? <clears throat> what does it mean for me, uh, a man, in Harlem or for you, a woman in, in Jackson, Mississippi or uh, Kingston, Jamaica or I'm Puerto Rico so what will want me to bring me back here? Is it just a Tutankhamen exhibit that came through a few years ago, a few cities in North America or the Ramses exhibit that just was there in uh, Tennessee and, and Nashville or, or in, or in uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, or so. It's that, all of that, and more. So let us explore what we have done thus far and what we intend to do uh, in another two days. We arrive at the Heliopolis Airport otherwise known as the Cairo International Airport, and we started our tour there. Unfortunately, there's only two, there were two buses and only one of me, and so I couldn't tell both buses, uh, give them a little trip from the airport into the hotel and point out some of the sites. Most, most of this that I told you in that bus was covered by the two guides we had, and we will have two guides consistently because we'll have two buses. But just so that I'm going to deal with the ancient part of Egypt and not the modern part of Egypt. Why did I revise the tour from the southern, starting in the south and coming to the north, or southern north and going to the south? I once did this, as I'm doing now. There are a lot of reasons of which we can't put the time in, but using that for what it is, you were at, yesterday, you were at the beginning of the United Egypt, a place called Mem Nefa, sometimes interpreted to mean the white wall or the white house. 
It is here that the America use to name many things. When we think of the White House, we in the United States think of white people name it White House because they're white. Has not at all to do with that as many other things in the United States. What had happened in the United States is some men who were basically English came or were brought to that area of land. But the phenomena of these men who had overthrown the old English system was that all of them were members of an organization called the Masonic system, except one member of the cabinet, and that was Benjamin Franklin because he was a Quaker. Those men belonging to this, that organization adopted a number of things to England, their mother country, and their mother lodge. Within that large system were two different ones, one called York Rites and one called Scottish Rite. And within those two rituals which they had adopted from a basic slab coming from Egypt, 22 rules of which they adopted, having no more, they added some political effables which they call effable rites. So thus from the 22nd degree to the 33rd degree, Y11, in honor of Jesus' 33 years of life, according to them. Thus, what is happening here, you would see in, reflected in the early America because they adopted it through the Masonic Rite. For example, the symbol of justice, which you have seen already and will see again, Goddess Ma'at with her scales, they left off, of course, her feather of truth. I don't think they had planned truth in the whole thing. Since the scales are not balanced, one scale is up and one is down. It is not justice, but just this. They adopted, again, the pyramid that you see out there, that exact one, the tallest one, and equally, which you're gonna see, the eye of Horus, which comes from a story dealing with Horace's uh, father being killed by his uncle. Horace revenging the death of his father, kills his father but in the process has his left eye knocked out. Thus on your American dollar bill, this too was adopted. The eye of Horace, which you call the evil eye. The pyramid, the, you see it there, and the sun bursts which you call symbol of God, Ra, was equally adopted. So what you're seeing in this, what I'm getting to speak about, you are dealing with Egypt every day of your life. From the first day you put the first dollar bill of somebody in your hand, you are dealing with Egypt without knowing it. You're dealing with the Nile Valley, your Nile Valley, yet you are made to feel estranged from anything dealing with that. If somebody dealt with American dollar at a long, before 1966, you have said, that is irrelevant. No, I don't want to hear about it. Not knowing your own history. So uh, that's one of the reasons for this, because it is here. Egypt did not start here. United Egypt. Re, as a matter of fact, we should say reunited rather than united. Egypt was reuniting 4,100 years before the common era or before Jesus the Christ as said from the Roman style. Egypt went through a reunification. We are accustomed to fight in this family. We are fighting now. But the one thing common about this family, we, ge we generally reunite. Don't care how we fight each other, this extended family got a, a way of coming back. And like a friend of mine, Professor John Clark said, the reason it happened that when the boats came, they didn't bring Jamaican, they didn't bring uh, Western Virginian, they didn't bring niggas, niggaboo, jigaboo, colored Negroes and whatnot. They, bring all, they brought all African. So at times we get 
African feeling, you know, want to come back together, and we do come back together, remembering, especially when the crackers start giving us blows. Uh, uh, can you ask the young gentleman when he finished to uh, uh, give us some service? Aye. Some service for uh, soft drinks and things. You've got to pay for your own, of course. Uh, so we can ease our palate while we have the lecture and questions of period. Now, what that has done, though, is to make us associate with our history and yet not knowing it. Uh, how would you have felt in first grade or second grade if you know that dollar had a part of you locked into it? Uh, uh, how would you have felt if you know Benjamin uh, ben Banneka had anything to do with the layout of Washington, D.C., especially if you were going to school? Just so. How would you have felt when you took up a Christian New Testament or a Jewish Old Testament and knowing that basically it was copied from you? You're going to see it. And that's what it means. What it means is when we talk about starting here at Memnefer, there where you saw the, the statue of Ramesses, one of the many statues of Ramesses, because you're going to see all kinds of statues of Ramesses, one it don't look like the other. Because I know a lot of you say, God, what a nose he must be not been, you know. But that's one of the statues. There's no accident why that was picked out to be enshrined. <laughs> Uh, we'll get that understanding as we go along. The, some of you probably missed the little thing that I run up the room 34 to so, the little thing written by my sparrow. I'm sorry if you didn't, but we are coming back. I am not the type to say, well, I finished and you're free day. If you want me to go back to the museum with you, I'll be glad to go back to the museum and discuss with you. The, as long as you're here, I work with you. Okay, now. <coughs> What we are talking about, we are, a, we are a spiritual people. Forget about religion. I don't deal with religion. It's a waste of time, a waste of money. But I deal with spirituality. It doesn't matter to me if you're Baptist, Presbyterian, Holy Roller, no rolling. It doesn't matter. You're spiritual. You are a spiritual people. Okay. What we're dealing with is what uni unified Egypt? We talk about the, reuni re the united Egypt, but everybody here talk about reuniting the people, the land. They never talk about re reuniting the spiritual force of the people. To me, that's the most important. What happened there at Memnefa, where we just came from, which a big city was a big complex. All of these things that you're saying are not, they're not a pyramid or three pyramids. It is a complex. When you went on the second floor, I'm sure that you saw the little model, you should have seen it, of a pyramid and the causeway and everything that goes with it. What you see at Memnefa or Memphis as it's called, again, uh, the Greeks adopted the name and the Americans who trace themselves back to Greece and so forth, adopted the name Memphis or Memnefa, is a story that started and that was culminated in the concept of a deity. It seems that Egypt had become prosperous and Egyptians started to fight. Africans of this land called Egypt started to fight themselves. They split up in two, two groups. One northerners and one the southerners and after a number of years from about 10,000 before the common era to about 4,100 years before the common era a period of a little better than 5,000 years one of the leaders of the southern group a man called Mena also known as Nama the Greeks later call him Menes, M-E-N-E-S. So the first spelling is Mena, M-E-N-A. The second spelling is Nama, N-A-R-M-E-R, -E which is mostly called. And the third or foreign spelling is Menes, M-E-N-E-S. Leading a group of 
are lords, as you would refer to it in the English language, came in contact with a fellow who led an equivalent group of people from the northern area. His name is Scorpion, spelled like the little insect or animal that will bite you and hurt you sometimes. The two of them could not agree with each other to come back and reunite this common land, what was called the two lands, and decide to fight it out, winner takes all. They fought, Norma killed Scorpion, and you know in those days you killed the leader, caused the reunification of these Tola and Kemet. But there was something unique happened at that particular time. You would think that Norma, who won, would say, well, all right, I won. My concept of the deity of God is the one that's going to dominate here. He could have done that easily. He won. But obviously, he was a psychologist because what Norma did, Norma's God, the God Ra, Worshipping the south. And Scorpion, the dead man now, his god, the god Amen, which was worshipped in the north. And by the way, right there, we have something to think about. You still worship your northern god. At the end of every prayer and the end of every hymn, you say, Amen. And then you want to me, mean so, so be it. No, 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 it meant Amen. One of the gods. But Nama said, no, I am going to make the god of the north and the god of the south one. But I'm not going to put my god, the god of the south, first. I will put the god of the north. The people will understand that I appreciate all of them. So he, he called it Amin Ra. But he knows I'm the boss anyhow. I am, I won, I got the control. I don't have to, such an ego, my name got to be first. I put, his, now what the people will not think, he's a good man. He's not bad, he fought, he beat our, kill our man, but by him, God, he means well. Look at that, he put our God name first and his name second. Won the people and united Egypt under one king. That's why they stopped using the word king to him and said Pharaoh of all Egypt. At the time, Egypt had 40 different states, 40 different uh, independent little governments. He brought them all together. So Egypt then had 40 states, 40 laws, like uh, what they call the admonitions to goddess matters or uh, negative confession, which you're gonna see in put this down. You're gonna see when you go excuse me, in the tomb of Ramesses the sixth. Uh, as the important thing, I will tell you what tomb or what temple you're going to find it, so that when you go there, you know to, if I'm not right yet, I said you could ask the guide, where is such and such a thing, if they didn't show you. I hope to be at all places with you, however, but one never know. Uh, to thank and may pay me a visit uh, sometime also. Uh, The Egypt was reunited. The soldiers were placed into one army, and here start what we call dynastic Egypt. You must make a distinction between dynastic Egypt and Egypt, because if you say Egypt began, you're wrong in 4100. Dynastic Egypt was always here from the time man set the place and call it Tameri or uh, 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 later um, size or, or Paul of the Nile or any such name before a lot of the different names that follow since that. And it is dynastic Egypt most of us mean when we speak it. So we are talking about dynastic. What is a dynasty? A period of reign, of rule by a particular person or a family. Or persons, for instance, a dynasty could be a day. A king could overthrow a fellow could overthrow the king, set up, and somebody overthrow him tomorrow. 
that's a dynasty gone right there. Or it could be 20 years. Or it could be torn from just natural birth. The Yankees had a dynasty in baseball that was overthrown, let's say, by the Orioles, who had two days, and then by the Detroit Tigers, who may have been just one year or two years. See, dynasty, a period of rule. Egypt was said to have had 31 dynasties. That is providing you're going to add the Greeks and the Romans as being part of the dynasty. I don't need to ask you. You've been in the museum. You've seen Greeks. And you've seen Romans. They don't fit, do they? When you look at the others, they don't fit. I mean, you don't have to be prejudiced, bias of any sort. They don't fit. When you look, <laughs> okay? Uh, so I don't need to go through that uh, thing for you because uh, if you got any eyesight, you see they didn't fit. But there was a man in Egypt who decided, as a matter of fact, he was forced, because we're talking about late, by the Greeks to tell them what Egypt was like historically. That man was called High Priest Manetho. M-A-N-E-T-H-O. High priest Manetho lived during the time of the Greek invasion of Egypt and was forced by Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedonia, which you like to call Alexander the Great, and I don't know why Egyptian guide continued to call that man great. There was nothing great about Alexander, the little punk, Huh? He wanted to speak to the uh, come. He wanted to speak to the the, the uh, what do you call it the uh, the great man the the um huh? oh, oh. the great um, well I, I'll go on but it's it's like the great seer uh, of. Oh, but I'll, I'll come back to it. But anyhow, the greatest thinker of the city at the time. And I, huh? No, no, no. I startling. I was startling. Nowhere. No, not the. Is the title rather than the man's name? But I'll, I'll get it. But he wanted to speak to this man, and the man refused. This Egyptian refused to speak to him, calling him an uh, insolent boy. So Alexander decided that he had to know the history of this great land. So he called on the 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 Amen the, 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 the I, I almost had it but I'll go on. Uh, but hell and he, he, this wise man and uh, he wanted to speak to him and my wise man refused. So he called upon the high priest they had slaughtered all of the priestdom except the, the high priest, Manetho, and asked Manetho, told Manetho to write down a history of Egypt. Manetho started by from the 4400 40, 40, uh, BC and said this would be the first dynasty. And for each dynasty, he said, there's so many kings as per so many years. Adding up all the kings and the years, that's why we can say BC such a such a date and such a date. Because we can count the amount of kings. Since Manetho did not use BC because there was no Jesus Christ yet. So he couldn't use BC. He used uh, so many kings, what we call Nile years. Do you understand? For instance, uh, when we speak of the ancient Egyptians in terms of AD and BC, that is late. That is the way that the Romans presented the history because you can't have before Christ when there's no Christ. See, Jesus is a journey come late, just yesterday. It, it, we never thought of it in our perspective we think that there was always a Jesus therefore we say before Christ and after Christ there was always a Christ to talk about before or after 
No, the one thing there was no Christ. He just came up the other day. Now, that thing is bothering. But Oracle, the Oracle of Anon, he wanted to consult the Oracle, O R A C L E, of Amun, which was the like saying the greatest intellectual of Egypt, and that intellectual thought he was a stupid little boy. To come and nobody of his consequence spoke to the oracle. Only great men came and consult with the oracle. And Alexander felt because he won a few wars in Persia that he gave him the right to come there and speak with this great brain. Well, Alexander soon after died. Is that an argument as how he died? Uh, that uh, when he killed his own. A brother, and that says that his mother's uh, child, uh, uh, that that caused him to break heart. Some said somebody threw a javelin in his back. It doesn't matter, but uh, that's when he killed Cletus Nigra. The is said to be his mother, the servant. Yet Alexander, when Cletus was dying in Alexander lap, and they said in law, a dying declaration is the best uh, evidence. Cletus says. Stoop, how stupid you are, Alexander. You have killed your own mother's son. Be that as it may, that is when Manetto divided Egyptian history into various dynasties. He could not put 31 dynasties because he could not include anything beyond the Greeks. That's when he lived. So when they say that Egypt has 31 dynasties and included Rome, that had to be wrong. It, they added that because Manetho died during the time of Rome, Greek rule, not during the time of Roman rule. So there again is a distortion of the fact. Be that as it may, Egypt then started her first dynasty at 4100. If you use the museum, the present museum, they use 3100. Some people used 3200. And some use as early as 50, 5000 ad. And if you look at the list of these Egyptologists and archaeologists, it runs from 5000 ad to 3000 as the first dynasty. I use 4100 because Manetho used 4100, and he's the one that started. I like to deal with the person that started the thing deal with him. And thus begins the modern, I call it modern, uh, listing of the Egyptian dynasties. What are we talking about? What is Egypt from the first dynasty to the third dynasty? That's the first major transition, the first major change in Egypt is going to take for you from the first dynasty and the third dynasty. What's going to be the, the dramatic change? What is it that we have in Egypt that is so similar to the other uh, states on the Nile, but on the third dynasty is going to change drastically from all the other countries? And the third dynasty becomes a man by the name of M. Ho Tep. I am H O T E P. He who comes in peace. M Ho Tep. That's what the word, the name means. He who comes in peace. But in Ho Tep is a man, ordinary man. What about him? So important. We had Nama. We had Aha, the second king. And Nama had unified the place, and Aha had start to beautify the place and everything like that. Everything was going good. We had from the first to the third dynasty. What is going to be so unique about this man? In Hotep, yes, he was a man, but he was not an ordinary man. Because this man is a physician. He is a poet. He's a historian. He's a, 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 a prime minister. He is an architect, he's a builder, he's an engineer. He even gave us the little quip that people quote so often in the Caribbean, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
that's from Inhotep. So when you sing your Calypso, you remember Inhotep. All right, he's all of this. So what? What is going to be most important is that up to now, everybody building houses out, out of wood. Everybody, uh, anything, even the king's house is built out of wood. But what happened? The rains, regardless of how infrequent they came, they rotted the house. Different uh, parasites, not like loving wood to keep, but to eat it, destroy the houses. Inotep for his God, his deity, and the body of his Pharaoh decided, my Pharaoh cannot be buried like any other Pharaoh. I got to have something more permanent, something that wouldn't ever be destroyed. And he said, I got the answer, it's stone. And so he built, before that, people used to be buried in Mastaba, a rectangular thing since a human being is longer than the human being is short or wide. Uh, some of us try to violate that rule. But he said, I won't do it that way. I will, it isn't nice to see because one angle, so he said, I'll make it square. So he built this square tomb for his pharaoh and dig a deep hole 92 feet deep. Can you imagine 92 feet deep in those years? And put his pharaoh down there that nobody could go and mess up, steal the things out, the coffin and so forth. But then he said, this is too ordinary. Everybody's buried in something like this. I will add another box on it, another one, smaller box. And then he says, this is, this too, it's too simple. I'll put one box for each year. So you have seen a, a, a wedding cake, right? So there is a seven-tier wedding cake, seven-tier box. And thus he said, one would represent the day of each year. And, since, and one would represent the season of agriculture. Seven years shall the land lay farrow, and seven years, right, shall it rest and so forth. And thus, the first stone building in the entire world. The first time man built in stone. Stone then was to survive everything else. And thus, because Egypt went towards stone, Egypt history survived. Those who created Egypt, Egypt's mother, Nubia, Egypt's mother, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, mother, Penwet, and so forth, did slowly vanish from history while she was blooming because of a stone structure that others follow. And then from that stone structure, he built uh, some of the things that you see, the mortuary temple. Both, some of them was false because only at that time people were stealing. So they built some false ones and some actual ones. Then he built, he said, he built a center of intellectual knowledge, the Grand Lodge. The thing you pass through that looks so modern in the front with these columns, with the fluted columns, that was the Grand Lodge. And there they set up the first man, first known education system, a school, a lodge. That is, was the Grand Lodge of Saqqara. Each state or province had a grand lodge. So of 40 uh, uh, states or province, they had a grand lodge. But the greatest of the grand lodge was the one in Saqqara. At the time, the pharaoh was Juza, D-J-O-S-E-R, or Sir, he was known also S-E-R, the Greeks call him Zuza, Z-O-Z-E-R. We are now on the threshold of what became the most powerful, the most intellectual, and definitely the most high cultured society in human history in terms of the impact it had on the world. 
these Africans, these Egyptians, follow suit when Imhotep, they develop a priestly system, but the people who, listen down, the people who work stone became known as the Mason and established a society called the craft, the sacred craft of Amun Ra. They didn't wear top hats, uh, cut away tails, <coughs> flip, color, and stiff bow tie looking like a damn penguin. Can you see a black man looking like a penguin in the heat of the Caribbean, the heat of Georgia, heat of New York? Talking about secret society marching down the street. How you were secret and you marching the damn street? <laughs> but uh, yeah. they were not St. John yet. Thus, couldn't have St. John Day. They were not Jesus yet. He didn't come yet. Mary wasn't born yet. This is a soul brother thing. With soul brothers only. No, you all feel bad because no European was there. You're all in bad shape. This is one time you were doing things without Europeans involved. I did beg to have them. I wish we could go back to those days after all. Now, Egypt was on her way. I understand. No, I'm sorry. You understand. If you, I understand it. Because when I first came here in 39, I didn't cry outside. I, I wish I'd cry outside. I cry inside. When you have your life locked up and people tell you all kind of lie and make you suffer all your life, and then you come and the load is lifted, you react any kind of way. You act any. And we went through a lot. And when you could come in and, and that burden is unloaded, uh, many of you may do it. Many of you who are mothers, especially you who are mothers and didn't have a piece of paper because before you come the mother, wait till you reach to Abyssimbal, I mean to uh, uh, Abydos. And then you're going to say, I had to pay a penalty of shame for no reason. And Abydos can lift it off your shoulder. I remember a, a woman bishop who burst out the same way at Abydos when she saw the Immaculate Conception and everything and the painting and so forth and heard her child call a bastard for 20 odd years talk about her child being illegitimate because she had a piece of paper. Then she found, you know, all of you realize Jesus is illeg illegitimate. Jesus, mother, mother and father was never married. Well, let's go on. You see, when you look at from this here, this organization, every organization you know, those of you with your Greek fraternity and Greek sorority, copied from this here. There was no Delphi, no Grand Lodge of Delphi to come up with Alpha, Gamma, Lapa, Bapa, Theta, all kind of junk. We didn't call them that. There were no such Greek language yet. There were no Greeks yet. But we had a language. We dealt with Medu nature. M-E-D-U, one word, nature. N-E-T-C-H-R-E-C-H-R, -E -E the next word. Medu, language or words, nature. Language of the words of the deity or the gods or the goddesses. One thing that the Africans had done at that time for every god, there was a goddess. One thing they did not become a masculinized society bias, and that's why I said uh, when people speak of the domination of men, you talk about European stuff. Because every god here had a goddess. And every god and goddess here have a, had a virgin birth child. 
because his goddess didn't run around and get no umpteen man and she knew who the daddy was. Every goddess, every quality of God, for every uh, for a goddess of love, there's a God of love. For a goddess of truth, there's a God of truth. You, you understand what I'm talking about? For every quality, there's a God, there's the equivalent God. So the, Egypt, the Africans of Egypt came up with what they call the law of opposites. For in there's out, for up there's down, for man there's woman. Anything you name, there is an opposite. And the ancients at that early stage with Inhotep and others not only came up with the concept, but drew, drew a diagram of the law of opposites which Plato tried to plagiarize. Talking about film, <laughs> P-H-E-L-G-N, and other such nonsense, and blood, and so forth, poor fellow. He had come and spent 15 years, but since a student wasn't allowed to write down anything of the books that were there, they had to memorize it. And somebody asked me, why is it, why well, you could remember so many things? I, I, I grew up in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. One thing the teachers used to do was make you get up and memorize a book. And tore your, your knuckles up when you, when you miss a sentence. Tell you, give you this, give me the story back. What? And he said, That's a joke. He would need the one, but they said so that you will know to retain what happened when you're on the place and they know book. They started, and from that they developed first thing a concept of moral laws. The admonitions to Goddess Maat. And what they did was to establish the superiority of death over life. We got it, life over death. But don't get me wrong, they're not saying we're going to try to die for dying's sake. They said we're going to try to die as a way, but we consider death the highest experience of life. Because the ancients said that to live you must have died, and to die you must have lived. That there is no beginning and no end, it's a continuum. That's where the European tried to change, and did change, the concept. Thus, we are forever begging for forgiveness for a thing our grandfather did 10,000 years ago. We are going to church begging, Lord, please forget me. When is he going to forget me and forgive me? Damn, I got to beg him for the same thing? Every, every weekend? No, the ancient Egyptians said, you don't got to ask, go and ask him for, this, for the same thing. Don't ask for it last week. What kind of God that is go not uh, accept? You come in honesty and you say, forgive me for the thing and say, come next week, say it again. So they said, no, you do a ritual. You prove, you take your big lamb. You only got one lamb. You give that to God. So the people are wrong. Slaughter the lamb and say, people come and eat. I was bad. God is going to, I want God to forgive me. I'm slaughtering the land for the community. You pay. Next week, 10 weeks, a million years from now, you don't ask for forgiveness for that same thing. You don't pay. That's why it was not necessary for sacrificial human rights. Unlike the pyramids of South America, these were not used. No sacrifice whatsoever. There was no record of a sacrifice of Egyptian sacrificing another human being. There were no sacrifice. There were gifts to the Lord, to God, fruits, vegetables for the people, the poor to eat. And you will see all of that and the walls and the temples and freezes as we go to travel in the different temples starting in Luxor. What they did, for example, was to established the ancient Africans of Nile of Egypt established the woman we had a discussion on the bus today I was coming from a whole different ball game that, than the western ball game and sisters couldn't understand me because we were, we were trained in western thing and I'm coming from an African position we established the woman as the symbol of justice peace and love you could get no justice, no peace, no love, unless you come by way of the female. Goddess, what is the symbol of justice and love? 
goddess Ma'at. You have to come with your heart as light as the feather of truth, the ostrich feather. There's no way that your heart can weigh less than an ostrich feather. But the symbolism of it is what we're talking about. And what is she holding? Two scales, scales of justice. <coughs> and for love, not the failure of love, who did or what did we establish? Goddess Hathor, with the two cow horns. And why did we pick out a, why did the ancient Egyptian pick out a cow to represent love? And not the bull. What we could do with the bull? Okay. We get his skin. We could get from him, of course, he mates. Uh, we get glue, his, his hoof, and so forth. But we get all those things from the cow. Can we get milk from the bull? At least not that kind. Can we get cream from the milk from the bull? Not that kind. We could go on. The, bill, the, 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 the cow is going to give us cheese. All those things we can get from the cow and we can't get from the bull. So the ancient Egyptians and other people along the Nile said, we must establish the cow as the seat of justice, but we don't remove the, the thing we make him associate of. And then the other animals where you can get from the male and let us balance it out. Thus, the ancient Egyptians said, we will put symbolism and we will do, use the fowl, the, uh, we use the beast, we use the reptile, all of that to explain attributes of God. Ministers get there and tell us the ancient Egyptian worship uh, chicken, they worship bird, they worship dogs, and no, they did not. And they people saying it no better, but they're talking about the plate, the money in the plate. That's why they sell them lies. And it got to be such a big lie that now those liars don't even know they're lying. The ancient Egyptian used the snake because of the quality of the snake. A snake venom will kill you, but the same venom will save you. You say, well, the, 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 the falcon which is most used, the falcon goes high as it can where other birds can't go, where even bullets don't go. But the falcon comes down and delivers a message, bring back message. It's a cunning bird, it's an intelligent bird. And so if we're going to talk about God, why not use the falcon as the symbol of qualities of God? And so we use the lion and the man's body, the, 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 the lion and the man's head, wisdom of the human being, but the strength of a lion. And so the African said, these attributes of God still is in one God, and what symbol can we use greater than the sun? So the Africans comes up, with the sun symbolic of God and the Pharaoh was the son of the sun S-O-S -S. the S-O-N of the S-U-N well let us see what you can have without the sun name it every living thing you see depend on the sun even the moon depend on the sun to shine, to shine. If the sun doesn't give light to the moon, there'll be no shine, light from the moon. Moon, moon would, be, would be a dud as it is without the sun. Chlorophyll come, you got no grass, nothing turn green. The cow can't eat, the, it would be no milk, no meat, no nothing. Uh, the grass wouldn't grow. Well, what better symbol can we demonstrate? Who is God? Where is God? The sun. What do you mean? Name me what you could do without the sun. That's God. That's the quality of God. What better thing could we use? What did they put behind Jesus' head? <coughs> Besides the halo, a sunburst, isn't it? They put the halo around Mary behind her head and the sunburst are behind Jesus. Uh, that, you, you, that's what we're talking about. Now, 
There is no way that a man who has been properly trained, that a, a priest, a Jesuit priest, don't know. He knows. The Jesuit knows all I'm saying to you, just that he ain't going to tell you. It's not his job to put himself out of business. But it's my job to tell you. To make you independently knowledgeable. To start you. This ain't going to be all. This is just a start. You got to do the rest. In this, it was necessary that they started to make instrumentations. But the Africans had already refined even a calendar. A calendar which had started in 10,000 BC called this a stellar calendar based upon the stars, the distance of the stars to the, to the earth. Everything centered from the earth. Everything centered from that complex of pyramid at Giza that you went to. Based upon that pyramid that some of you went upstairs, got frustrated because there was nothing in the room. And then your knees paid the price. <laughs> Not going up but coming down when you got there and those tendons start to pull back. <laughs> My son said, I'm a strong young man, but ooh, <laughs> I feel so wobbly. <laughs> you see, it gives you a chance to marvel, but then you find out that all that work for 20 years to build that was not just for fun or decoration, that it had astrophysical proportion and meaning. Thus, they were able to measure from the earth to the sun, to the other planets, the stars, the moons, and therefore come up with a system we're going to see, which you la later call the zodiac, which is really Greek nonsense. They didn't call it that nonsense. They didn't even make it up when they make it rectangular, the Greeks. After the, the French stole the original, they put back a fake one. And you all can't come out the house until you consult your zodiac. <laughs> hmm? That's what the sisters, that's what the sister cry out. All the mess that she had to suffer wrongly and make her feel guilty. And when in fact it's the other way, it's hers. I know I felt bad. We, we gonna, as we deal, and we're going now where the, most of the symbols that we're gonna see is in the Luxa area. And the areas around Luxa where we're gonna be dealing with. What we've seen in Saqqara, and what we've seen here at Giza, is man's attempt to establish himself with his maker, creator, male, female, whatever. Man's billing for a permanent place to remember he is going to be long dead and short lived. When you consider how long you're going to live and how long you're going to be dead, you're going to live no time. You're going to see grave been here 10,000, 12, 20,000 years ago. Some human being so long they're petrified like stone. So you see why the ancient Egyptian, you can't find the king's palace, but you find where the king used to pray. Because what the ancient is saying, I will build monuments to death. Because death is more permanent than life. There's no permanency in life. And he said, since I can't believe that the creator will make a man just to perish and it's finished, I will develop a concept of life after death. I will theorize what the Lord must have meant and I will make the obligation thus the negative confession. Hail, Ma'at. I have not killed man nor woman. Hail, Ma'at. I have not spoken with a fork tongue. Hail, Ma'at. I have not made light thy bushel. Hail, Ma'at. I have not taken any man's woman 
Oh men, hail my heart, I have not defiled any woman's body. I have not defiled her. I have not lied to her just to get into her body, then walk off, and then expect her to be a good woman after that. I have not set her on a, on a course of wrath, of angry. I anger. I tell her, oh baby, I love you, I'll marry you, and then when I get it, I go off. And then I said, why is she mad? Why is she did my Ali that they went with her? You forget that he lied to her. It's not the going with her. That's not what bothering her. Because somebody's gonna do it anyhow. But it's the lie, the deceit in which she had to give up her body. Huh? So that start the ball rolling. So why did she hate men so? When the first man figure up, and she hated because she can't trust the next man. You understand? Of course, that is on, on the female side. I know you brothers are saying, but man, see, I'm talking about balance. I'm just talking about what the thing is. Of course, I'm guilty of some of that too, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not telling you on a better rose, but I know why I'm not, I'm not gonna pass it up. I know why it didn't mean nothing to the, the education system which I came under. Prepare me for that. The Adam and Eve story. The Adam and Eve story will tell me that I could believe that a woman came from my rib cage. Now, if I, I got a reason to lie. The lies in the Bible, the first lie I read, that a woman come from my rib cage, eh, here, a woman got, got everything for baby, gonna come to a rib cage. <laughs> hmm? Then God gonna for, forget the formula of making people from dirt and got to steal a rib from me to make her. And I count her ribs the same as mine. Somebody make, make up for the lost rib. But we get tight, uptight if I say this, but we, do, we could go back to the original story. And the original say, man, came and woman came from an abysmal deep and doesn't explain it they don't know but they know you know mama know and you should know let us see who's right after that seed slipped down the fallopian too get fertilized slip in to that ovary and then settle in what you call the placenta. Isn't it deep, dark, and abysmal pit? Isn't it? Is there light in there? Isn't it water in there, it's liquid in there? Isn't it abysmal deep that can take 10, 28 days to come out in a normal span, not nine months, 20, 10, 28 days? And when it comes out, isn't it heaven? You're looking for heaven, but what the book of the day tell you, heaven is at the end of a woman's legs. You read it, Peppy one is the one that said it in the book of the dead. Where is your mother's womb? Where is your mother's, um, what do you call it, lane? The, 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 placenta isn't at the end of her leg by her crutch isn't it in there no but you looking for heaven in the air when you've been in there you came out of there some of you trying to get back there quite often at that I mean it is no there's a heaven in the physical human sense and there's a heaven in the mental sense I love both of them of course but we can't deal with it because the West tell us there's something nasty, something bad about a human vagina. That's the way we've been trained. And therefore, we call it all kind of name. Women tell the daughter, it's your dollar. Hey, 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 go wash your dollar. Associate a fee with it. You know, go wash your money. Hey, all kind of thing, you know. We call it pussy. All kind of ugly name because we have no value of it. So my mother said to me, I, come here boy, as a big enough, she'll kneel down. 
And he long. She said, put your face where you came from. I put my face direct to my mother's vagina, pressed my head, she said, no. Every 31st of December, you come to me and take the same position because it's my birthday. When my sister was born 18 and a half years later and my sister grew up, she said, come to me on August the 13th. Every August the 13th. Until I relieve you of the responsibility because it's my birthday. She had two birthdays that year. She had more, but they died. She said, you ain't got no damn birthday. Don't mind you hear those children saying, it is my birthday. You, I push you out. All you did was come out. It's my birthday. And then I found my grandmother, Ethiopia, tell me, all of them tell me, it's my birthday. <clears throat> we got 15 children, 15 birthdays. So what you did to have a birthday? You just come out of there. But if you understand the meaning of it, then we wouldn't rape our grandmother. All the rapes you've been hearing about young 17 year old brothers raping sisters, 89, 90 years old, he had a man in 30 years, threw them off the roof, take the pocketbook, because they had the birthday. Their mother didn't have the birthday. So they had none to honor. It wasn't heaven they honoring. They don't think of their mother's womb as heaven. You could talk about bitch and put your foot in her uh, ten, two, uh, eight and size eight and a half deep into her go behind. What do you care? She's in heaven. But if she was heaven, as the as the uh, the book of that said, then you will handle heaven with delicate care. That's where the ancients started. So not only did they started the physical thing. To me, Egypt isn't so much its physical phenomena and which is magnificent but what done to Egypt is set the moral principle that others had copied and then later find to be not working in terms of dollars and cents it is too righteous for us to keep because it doesn't back our exploits in dollars and cents it puts us too much it says we don't say thou shall not I order you, don't do it. No, we said, we ain't going to talk about that. I have not. Hail not. I have not. Made light. The bushel, I haven't sell you short change. I put them put a piece of washer in the way to make the pound of corn heavier than it is. I have not spoken a lie. You see, they said, don't do it, but nobody said. You see, when the minister said, don't do what I do, do what I say. Why? Why should I do what you say and not what you do? Why should you be allowed to screw all the girls in the choir, but I can't have one? Hmm? No, I go watch what you say. If you say, if you say this is so good to do and you're not doing it, I'm not coming to your damn church no more. You stay in there by your damn self and support yourself. But you can't do that because you're scared you're going to do the same thing. So you can't tell a sucker, I'm not going to support you no more. So I'm going to wind down this aspect of it and just tell you that what we are about to see is not only the physical aspect. We're going to deal with the spiritual aspect that made your ancestors that great. Because it's the spiritual aspect that make them do the material things that they did. The spiritual aspect that makes them build these great buildings. Produce science, mathematics, a language, uh, for you to be able to talk and write and communicate with each other to count spiritual needs uh, that they were trying to do. When you see the different hats, the different crowns they used to represent each different qualities and the temple of goddess Hathor on both sides of the temple you're going to see the 28 different hats and crowns. It is the spiritual aspect that make them show, you see the pictures of Nut, show God uh, uh, Ra coming out of heaven, coming out of a woman's vagina in the morning, in a, in a little chapel, in the morning, where the sun, uh, the rays of the sun, while goddess 
uh, Hathor, the goddess of love, stays there smiling as she watch the tree of life. Ain't got nothing to do with no forbidden nothing. The Jews took it and distorted and called it forbidden tree. The tree of life, you can see the tree of life with no forbidden, forgiven principles and things at all mentioned where they, where they got. And took in the sun in the night. Loose it in the morning of her vagina, take it in the night in her mouth, and then you see the suns in different parts of her body showing the woman as the producer of life. But you see, they weren't worried about masculine, they didn't need to be macho and all that kind of thing. They didn't need uh, John Wayne or anybody else. You see, they didn't suffer to be big macho. That don't mean she didn't ask the wife to bring you the food. But they didn't put their foot in her behind and then say, bitch, come over here. And that's where we lost something, is that when we start to become so economically superior of each other, and then we make the woman a statue of beauty in the house rather than a helpmate. I think we could stop here. We had a lot of time and question and answer period. And uh, uh, this will hold you till we get in the south for the next lecture. Uh, it was, I know, a long double lecture, but it, you had it coming. And I wanted you to get in a frame of mind where we could understand each other. So I open to questions and answer. Uh, yes, ma'am. You said that every god had a goddess. Yes, ma'am. Did any gods have more than one goddess? And if they didn't, I didn't. Why? I don't know of any. Do you think that that means that there was a kind of corresponding one to the other, and the the intended family in that case was? I can't say so because it was just theory and I can't put back my theory based upon my living now and the environment now to what the ancients might have been thinking because it's so long I would have had the conditions under which they live to come up with the answer but based upon my understanding of things now uh, you could ask me the question more direct. Do I believe in polygamy as against monogamy? Do you think polygamy is, is inherently African? And yes, and I see nothing wrong with it, no more than I see something wrong with monogamy or polyandry. Uh, people make a system that suffices their needs. Uh, I have been in one poly, uh, polyandrous society, by the way, uh, don't feel bad, that's where a woman have more than one husband. Uh, I've been in India, where there's a population of tremendous, it's one a rare thing, where there are about 30 men to each woman. So, otherwise that men go kill themselves, you had to find some way in which they could mate. So, the one woman had to be the wife of 10 or 15 men. Now, it, it sounds funny, somebody, Western miners jump up immediately, sexual intercourse. Automatically, we think of man and woman, we think of uh, screen each other till we die. Uh, no, the, those men, they stipulated times in which they were mate with her. As a matter of fact, they, there were times that nobody, none of the men were having any sex because she had just had a baby and she couldn't be touched by a man for two years. I know in, among the community where the so-called Falasha, where I came from, uh, when a woman gave birth, you couldn't touch her for two years, not for herself alone, which was also, but for the child. The child needed two years to develop personality and do everything. Plus, she needed two years to heal her back. Western society with all the modern things, they're coming around to that now. And so that the sex played its part, but it played just as much another part as food would play, or clothing. Uh, when we think of polygamy, monogamy, and polyandry, we immediately think of promiscuity, and, it, and they have nothing to do with each other. 
So uh, though they did not have uh, a monogamous behavior, uh, I mean polygamous behavior, uh, to me it doesn't say anything about the social life of our uh, things. Because since the king had a polygamous uh, marriage. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Ben, we, we all respect you and the work that you've done and with Evan uh, by our presence here at this tour. You, I, I've heard you mention a number of times as to your respect and the importance of the African American, or the African woman. Um, however, at the same time, uh, I've heard you make various comments which in a sense kind of sends mixed signals and if you mentioned in terms of during your presentation this evening in terms of the spirituality and again the significance of the African woman um, does that do you see any type of inconsistency there or is there, am I missing something or in other words, should this be carried out? The, the if you if you really believe in the African woman, should this be something that's carried out in one's everyday actions and comments as far as from the African man? Uh, I am the by, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the biological father of eight daughters. all of whom are married and mothers. Some are grandmothers, because I'm a great-grandfather. Does it mean, because I respect them and owe them an honor for being just women, that I don't chastise her for being wrong? Or at least let her know I think she's wrong and then let us respond to me to show where she isn't and we have a discussion. I didn't say to love her without reason. I said, and I repeat, I glorify the African woman. I don't love the African woman. I glorify, that's a higher stage. And not only that, that is not a high stage. The highest stage of a relationship is respect. It's higher than love. Love you have no control. It's an emotion that you can't say nothing about. I could fall in love with a prostitute in the morning and can't get, get out my system. But don't respect her. <laughs> can't respect her. So when I respect her, that's the highest stage. Because I'm going to try for her not to be hurt by things I do. Now, in that statement equally, there are forces in which I interplay and interplay on me. And in such, interplay on her. And we get mixed signals. She may feel the respect for me as I do her. But in trying to make a living, trying to do everything within the society in which we live, we get off the keel and we clash with each other. And so often we got to get back and say, well, wait now, wait now. I love you and I respect you. What are we doing here to each other? So it go because that human element in me. Yes, I got that moment when uh, I got that moment when I act beastful. I, I can't understand my child vengeance. My words fail me, and I whoop! I hit a beat the hell out my child. I don't hit my woman. I never make that mistake because if I respect her, I ain't gonna beat her. Because any woman that's stupid that I need to beat, I don't want. I'm going to do it for you at the temple of, I tell you just where I'm going to do this. You at the temple of uh, Isis, otherwise called the island of Philae in Aswan. 
Uh, I wouldn't do it to, the, to you before then. I forget we're traveling this way. I'm going to do it for you at Abydos and Dendera. The, Abydos is the temple of Setaiwan. Dendera is the temple of uh, goddess Hathor. I'm going to show you the immaculate conception and the virgin birth that you could put your hand on it. As a matter of fact, I'll let you put your hand on it and see where the concept of Jesus, Mary, and the Immaculate Conception Virgin Birth came from. You're going to touch it. You're going to touch the resurrection. You're going to take pictures of it. You're going to be right there. That's when the sister, it, it going to release in you. You may not respond. respond. It's going to release in you the same emotions. You're going to actually touch it and see where it came from, the concept. 4,100 years before Mary, Jesus, and Joseph. They came here and got it. There are 16 crucified saviors. 16. Jesus is the last. Okay, I mean, in between that, I mean, Christianity is the Roman occupation. No, it changed, Paul. Well, That's what I want to say. Yes, I hope you feel it, Tim. Okay. Not only are you going to say that, but we're going to show you how they dig in cross. Quote unquote, the hidden temple. I'm going to carry you to the temple of uh, Thutmose III in Karnak and show you the triad, the trinity, how they chop off the Christ early Christian, chop off the head of goddess Mut, chop off the head of her son, God Chums, and leave her husband head, uh, Petah, to make it look like a crucifix. Yeah, I'm going to carry you to show you that and let you touch it so that when you go back you the touch you got your eye to remember you got a feeling you know you feel and touch to remember when you when it come to that you can say well wait now wait now I saw the original and it's me you're a sister you say I know I know what Mary had to feel it is me it come from I taught her to feel as a virgin woman. And it has nothing to do with the hymen. That's another thing. The Nicene Conference, which you refer to, changed the concept from the virgin birth, a clean birth, to a hymen extravaganza, that Mary still had her hymen. That is a new thing. How the hell is she going to be pregnant and still get her hymen? But you see, they willfully mix up the word hymen and virgin to be one. You can't be have your hymen and still be pregnant. Unless that guy had a less than a fly or mosquito penis. <laughs> yes. Colors to demonstrate things. For instance, in the circumcision sheen, the 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 one circumcising is always brown. The one being circumcised is always yellow. It, it the, the color demonstrated different things, and the ancient Egyptians had no color system or races as the Western society. They had people who look in, look in different shades brown yellow and in south they deal with it but it had no significance more than they were brown or they were yellow but not they were inferior because they were brown or the yellow or the green if, uh, for instance at a funeral was always going to be white always you will ne never see ancient egyptian funeral unless the deceased is in white the mourners is in white every funeral Oh yeah, that's birth. Green represent birth, new life. Even in in, in our side, the fresh grass is green. The, you know, green is normally in most societies a representation of new life. Yes, ma'am. That's these modern Egyptian. Not we're not talking about the ancient Egyptian. Ancient Egyptian bury when they get time to bury them. No, ancient, what is dirt? 
No, and you cannot meet and you cannot meet an uh, Egyptian because they want to be here with God. Them. That's Christian, Muslim, and Jews. Don't accept cremation. They don't accept cremation unless there's a terrible disease and they got a boy in the body, otherwise everybody will die. Uh, like a certain type of fever or something like that. They don't cremate. They don't cremate. And, and after the wash, the, the body is washed. A woman, of course, wash a woman, a man wash the woman. You never have the sexes mixing and washing the body and prepare the body oil it so the death cell really carry it to the mosque if it's, 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 if it's um, a, 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 a Muslim, the certain rituals are sell, and the men carry the, the body on a trough like, and the body is just wrapped. It's wrapped and wrapped in a canvas, cover the head and everything. And then it's lowered into the grave like that. They don't make a coffin or something. When you see coffin and those big things like the state funeral, like the president died and they make it a big show. It, not the prominent people, but certain prominent people. Because you could be prominent and don't get no state funeral in, and that they're going to put you in the same wrapping. You got to be a, to a certain, like the president. A, a president, people coming from all over to see the president and so forth. And it's, in, in Saudi Arabia, they're going to they're gonna bury him anyhow. The president will know and just have a ritual up when he's gone. So it depends on which Muslim state. But that's modern. That's that's not. But they still have the uh, the old practice of going to the cemetery and eating and giving food. I forget what that the the, the, the day when everybody go to the cemetery to eat and they bring food for the dead and so forth. But that, that's come that comes through Islam from ancient Egyptian rituals. Yes, sir. The, the scarab. The scarab is the symbol of one of the symbols of resurrection because you know there's a scarab every 28 days will go into the dung uh, of the, the horse or the uh, any bovine or any animal that chew its cud about t uh, three or four times uh, that dung and don't come off for, uh, for, uh, for a period of time and the ancient believe it died and resurrected. So it's one of the symbols of a resurrection. It also used to guide Ra in his travel to another world. So the common dung beetle is, is considered God Kepra, K-H-E-P-R-A. It's not spoken anywhere along the Nile or anywhere that I know because no one knows the vowel songs and where they were placed. There's many a attempt by people to say that they speak in ancient Egyptian. It's poppycock. Uh, because since the ancient Egyptian didn't write with vowels, vowels are applied based upon how the individual feel. We don't, we don't, unless we could find some writing with the vowel song and there are none of the writings with vowel song. Not only am I, I, I can speak for myself in this case, I may refer to some I think in working in some of the direction. Uh, just like now you saw my son with a big book. It is a new manuscript, a 500 page manuscript, and I got to cut the museum and the temples and do check, back check it because it got to be accurate and therefore it has to take five, six years of checking. Uh, and I've always been working three or four manuscripts at the same time. Now, uh, the digging, I've gone back to archaeological digging with a group and so forth. Unfortunately, the production of books in this field is a slow process. And uh, from 36 to now, I've only been, been, been able to produce 32 books in, in 50 odd years. Uh, the, one of the problem is not only the production of works, is the certification of the production of that work, the very, very verification. And what we are doing constantly is using, using book primarily by Europeans in the library, copying the same lies or 
just taking a lie and, and turn around the lie and say, that's it. Uh, we need more African. We, we, we have one African archaeological team, yours truly, one in the whole of Egypt. The Japanese got a team here. All practically all European groups, the Germans, the, the Swedes, the Czechoslovakians, the, I've got a team here. The Japanese got a team here. All digging for verification of what happened in our culture, and we won't do nothing sitting up in libraries. You see, because we don't want to put, we don't want to get con. The hurt, you know, and the hard. And some girls don't want to touch it on with a corny hand. Uh, and we want to get it by re remote osmosis. And always looking with pretty ties and sitting back with finger nails, blindly cured. And we don't want to come and do that field work. And that's the problem, sir. We need a host of brothers and sisters here. And the government will be glad to, to, to give the brothers, to certify them to do diggings and so forth. But they don't want to do that. Everybody wants to sit down and discuss slavery. I mean, hell, everybody. I mean, we know about slavery, shit. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we were not the only slaves in the world. Uh, but everything you look in the book is down for something about slavery. Uh, we need to be positive. No, don't get me wrong, though. You've got to talk about slavery. We're not going to forget it. But we need a, the positive side of what we contributed and did. I, I need my little great-grandson. I got the, lo the youngest one is about, about four or five weeks. I saw the Virgin Islands about a week ago, two weeks ago. I want him to know what his ancestors did in building the world. More so than because he got caught, somebody came and beat him in a war and took him over. That's a negative thing. Anybody could be a slave. Just get beaten and caught. <laughs> No, but anybody couldn't have built the pyramids. Anybody couldn't have given the world mathematics. Anybody couldn't have given a sign. When we go to the place, I'll show you this, the mathematics, just right there on the wall, the number system, everything. That I want him to know that, so that he know that the number man ain't got a damn thing, or the, or the, the forget the number man, he's just a lot minor. But the drug man ain't got nothing to get to, to that he need that he could make, he could become a scientist, maybe not got the money as fast, but at least the young man will get killed for the money he got. But whereas he wouldn't kill for a scientist, the little money he got, he'd be having it to use. I got to build an image in that little great grand, whatever it is, and my children, that they gonna, that money is important, but it is not important as the scientist who just created or do whatever it is for to stop the quote unquote common coal. Huh? To stop the common coal is more important than a billion dollars and a Mercedes Benz. Without all of the hullabaloo. And of course, if you stop the common coal, you're going to have all kind of hullabaloo. Yes, Mama and Daniel, sir. Since many of us have been so miseducated, um, it would probably be necessary for us to at least get some kind of background before we decide we're going to come over here and dig. And oh, yes. Oh, no, I don't mean just go and dig. You can't do it anymore. <laughs> so what kind of academic preparation would you think best in order to prepare to come here and actually do some serious work? Architecture, engineering, uh, any of the sciences, what they call the hard sciences. Uh, even, even, even theosophy, I didn't say religion, theosophy. Uh, but you must have something besides theosophy. Mostly the, the best combination with that would be languages. Uh, you must develop a skill in languages. And that's one thing America is bad for. Most Americans is monogamous. They only speak one language, and that's English. Uh, because of the arrogance at one time that the world needed them and they didn't have to know but nobody is English but Japan has put a stop to that uh, <laughs> so uh, you should have but you could come here without knowing Arabic uh, 
him to teach as an English teacher. Right now, they're begging for English speaking teachers to speak and to, to teach in Nubia. You don't have to know Arabic because you're teaching advanced, uh, students who advance in English. No problem on carry right to the man if you're interested. <laughs> I carry right to the no, to the Aswan uh, Cultural Center, and they're gonna sign you up. Then you would tell them what day you could come. Really, I mean, I'm an elementary teacher. In English? English if you teach English, if you yeah. Yeah. English yeah. Right. You can't be like a math teacher. No, you gotta be an English teacher teaching math English. You gotta show some certificate that you teach in America English or wherever it is you teach English. So yeah. Certified in your state, at least two years, three years. I, I think enough to teach a junior high school uh, English. And I, anybody who interested, I, I carry, I serve, get to ask when, uh, because it's bigger for me, I delivered. <laughs> I promise that that would be when I delivered. Yeah, and you don't have to know, they figure the students are available to take your teaching in English. So they don't need your help in that, in that. and then you will pick up uh, Arabic yourself and a Nubian language. <laughs> uh, I think I promised one here and, and this, you, she, her hand, and then I'm going to come and. I just would like to say something in respect to what the brother asked. How can he help us? Yeah. Or what can he do? As we labor, we have to teach our children. As we labor, teach your brother and sister, your brother's child, your child, and just teach them. And that's something you don't have to wait you get to, you get that too. But right now you teach your children. I have great grandchildren and I teach my children who they are. I and think, I think in the process, Beryl Banfield, okay, you know, I tried to remember that name just a few weeks ago when I was in the United States at a very important <laughs> lecture to tell some people to contact for children book. And I couldn't remember her name for nothing. And right now, I, you just said that I said Barry Banfield. <laughs> How the human mind. We wait for the authority to teach our children. You can see what they've done. How the human mind. Learn and teach our children. They need it now. <clears throat> but we, first, we have to get the material to teach them. And unfortunately, the material which our researchers uh, put up and one of the, the thing I try to purposely do is to write at a level no higher than a seventh grade education because some of the books brothers and sisters write I can't read they're too high for me they, can, they can't read it because they write it with a big lexicon at the side and put words that they get trouble with 15 syllables and so forth now to get the material there's no, no shortage of the material there is shortage of the material at a level in which the child could understand. Uh, oral tradition is fine, but the child is going to be every place with the teacher. It needs something written down to so go with. Now what the child need is teachers who are going to, writers, who are going to translate or take that writing from this heavy English into a literary state where the child could feel comfortable with, feel associated to. And some of the problem, the, the major problem that I found is material where the child could read and digest without having to always run in every, every second word into a lexicon or, or a di dictionary. So that's the, the problem. Yes, I agree with you that uh, the mothers or the guardian or whosoever have to pass on to the child. I know that one of the things I did well, I, I'm crazy about something. I believe that a child in the mother's womb is listening to me. A bit of strong. So, so I will get there and... I, I like playing with the baby in the mother's uh, womb because I feel connected to the child that way. And I talk to my child. I, I teach my child uh, the, the, the lessons in, in the womb. And some people think I'm crazy, but I, I believe that somehow the child here... I, I may be off there. I know I got some of my, That's one of my idiosyncrasies. But I believe strongly that children in there learn because I know something I see, I say certain things. Uh, I got one of my grandson that is very close, live very close to me, and he comes back to the, to the house, he's now four, and fantastic. 
But sometime I spoke, spoke, I said something and something, and he's around and nothing. Then one day he would come up to me and said, Granddaddy, uh, so and so and so and so. I said, where you get that from? He said, you said, you see? So I, I believe, just like they, they paid me no attention at the time, heard it, digested, still playing what he was doing, I feel little babies. That, that's why I never said to him, a little baby, do 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 da 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 da. Nonsense. I said to the baby, what are you going to do now? You know, not do 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 da 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 da. <laughs> when I say teach your children, I mean in an everyday. Yes, all right. Everyday atmosphere. My great grand came home and she's seen this junk food jingle about the Burger King and King all the Pizza Hut. And I said, you learned that in school? Also realize that is a junk food jingle. Yeah. I said, you I don't have to start an argument with your teacher, but realize. And she, she says, oh, no, Grand, no, 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 no. And when I told her again, it is a junk food jingle. Think about it. I, I, I agree. She came back and she says, and that there's this other parents, not my, my great friend. I don't want to be running and interfering in here and everywhere. But teach <coughs> her yeah. every day. And you will be surprised she has a better memory than me. Do not, and you saw those children, I mean, doing work in that factory that you couldn't do. Why? Because they were taught, and these children have a great amount of sense until we start bogging down. <coughs> One thing you take in where you're at, what you're saying is true, but you take those same children know nothing about their Egyptian heritage, but they know about their Arabic heritage. Well, and that's what that. The children can learn. I also intend to teach my. Yeah, but what do you teach? Well, is a, what is a, the they quality. Have greater potential that we have given them in our minds, they have much more. I'm trying to see just like these kids can do the job. If you taught them a language, they would learn that too. Yeah, but what I'm saying, what we're saying now, you got an available, even the child has an available amount of time to learn a certain amount of things. What are you going to teach them are the most important to the life? Because I'm taking the, the best examples, those youngsters, five to nine, on that uh, um, machine, that contraption. You take those children and they know absolute, they know they had the basics in Quran. They had basics in Arabic literature. But they had no, unless it's an exceptional child, no basic training in ancient Egypt whatsoever and most of it is considered still taboo in Egypt. We got a big fight, I'm in, involved with a big fight, as what is to be included in the elementary school in Egypt, a, a material content for the Egyptian child. And, and Egypt, the, the, for instance, the pyramid is still a taboo. And the Sphinx is still Abu El Hull. They some, the old uh, faithful man. <coughs> Children are not. No, we don't deal with it. We know that. We, we know, I said, uh, given that, I accept that. Them every day. That's I, why I said, you don't have to wait to book my great grand, all my grandchildren. I can talk to the great grand when we were younger. My children will listen. They will know about my experience like they've been here. But you can't teach them if you don't know the, so, the material, right? <coughs> the question was, what can we start? I mean, the point is, I'm saying that we can teach our children what we've learned. We cannot wait, not that books shouldn't be made, but we cannot wait for the system to change for us to start dealing with it. You deal with it now. I'm saying children have a great potential, all children. I don't think anybody here is waiting to until a certain book or books come out. Uh, we, but we can't transfer to the child what we're not knowledgeable of. So we must start by educating the parents, the guardians or whatever it is, the adults, so that they could pass it on to the children. We normally, I, 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 the pecking order is generally the parents 
to the children, to the grandchildren, to the great grandchildren. That's the normal pecking order. But what we can't deal with the pecking order if the person to pass on the first information knows not even the source of the information, much less the information. That's what I'm saying. I'm not uh, uh, at all disagreeing with you that children, children is the one to teach. That's why they're the one to learn. And they're susceptible to learn because they are not built up their mind that this is bad and, th and that is good. Sure, no question. Yeah. Uh, over here. <laughs> I saw when I was at the museum uh, that most of the the artists uh, carvings of uh, most of the artists carvings of uh, most of the pharaohs and queens that I saw always had their left uh, leg extended forward. Like it means like that pharaoh. Said about that pharaoh or queen is said about that person while they were living that the story is about him in life if the two feet are together and the arms are this way they are speaking about him in terms of death it's called the osirians this is the osirian stance god osiris osirian stance and there was a flail in this hand and a crook in this hand uh, this is equal osirian stand but left Right, left, like the army marching, you always start up left. Why left? The hard side. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, oh this, this lady and then you. Oh. Yes, uh, Dr. Spam, my question goes to, uh, I've heard you mention that the ancient Egyptians were fire worshippers, and I want to know what, uh, what role does fire have in their religious and spiritual ceremonies, if any? Ancient Egyptians were not fire worshippers. They took recognition of the fire Correct. and its potentials and so forth. So they did pay honor and reverence to fire. Pay honor and reverence to water. They, they worship the Nile because, as it said, were it not for the Nile, there'd be no Egypt. Egypt is the gift of the Nile. They, the God, they have the goddess of uh, the Nile. The god goddess uh, is hermaphrodite. Uh, it has breasts. As a matter of fact, happy have one. Happy have two breasts and one penis. Uh, happy took off from Bess. Bess has about eight breasts and one penis. Uh, so the god goddess of the Nile was hermaphrodite, both male and female. And uh, uh, the god of Nile was considered the greatest of the gods, one of the great of the god concept. So uh, there's a god of fire. There's a god of of electricity, thunderbolt. Neat, neat is the god of electricity, thunderbolt. He's shown showing thunderbolts. That's where the Greeks get it from. In the ceremony, was fire present. In in the Yes, they have. There were fire rituals in which they burn a fire, and so forth. Because they had to look at what fire did. Fire gave them to able to cook food, to smelt iron, to. Uh, uh, in other words, they pay reverence to that which uh, molded their life, which impacted on their life. Uh, for instance, the ancient Egyptians would not cook a bird that they kill without saying some, some reverence over the bird's body because they know if they didn't have the bird they would eat so it's like me i i i i in in um, northwest ethiopia there is a group called tri the tri people pray at almost anything and i when i go among the tri i pray to trees some some people say man you pray to a tree i say yeah it's good try because the tree says they have to cut down a tree for firewood or they're going to make a canoe or what it is or a boat they would do make, just accident a statement and they said to the tree i am so sorry i have to cut you down last week when i passed here and it was raining your branches covered me the other day i came to get a bird and i found it here in your tree 
and now I must cut you down. And they go through the whole thing and they start to cry. They feel it deeply. And then they cut the tree and the trees start to cry, they weep. And then they, they suck the tears. They go through a whole ritual, they suck the tears of the tree. And then they cut a little more until the tree fall dead. Then they will not let the tree to die a slow death. They go and dig all the roots out. So the tree will have a quick, and then they bury the rest of the tree to a funeral. And Westerners can't understand that, but they don't have a problem of, ec of ecology because they live an ecological life. Yeah. yeah yes. Thank uh. I would like to use to help me. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to synthesize um, a 470 by transitional period. I'm searching for the pharaohs at the time, at this time, 471 period, starting with Joseph when he went down to Egypt, coming up after, you know, coming out of the Exodus. That's the problem with never Joseph here. That's the problem. There was never a Joseph here. That is, okay. that's Jewish mythology. Okay. Do you, what I, my reason for coming to Jesus is to find time that I find time to go to my listening to you and go to the books. I want to find out the pharaohs at this time, during these, these years, transitioning years, 471 BC, 471 years before. Uh, and I will give you them right there. That's the Persians. They wouldn't be Egyptians. Beginning at 19 BC, coming down to 14 BC. Now, Ramesses is long before then. That's 1298 to 1232. Seti is Ramesses' father. That would be uh, uh, 1370 to 1298. Seti father would be Ramesses the first. Ramesses father would be Haranhem. Haranhem father would be uh, Ment uh, Mentuhotep the third. And then you go into the um, the Tutmoseses. Okay, but in that period, I, I just want you to help me get in. You know, I, I'm here to do some work. Yeah. And it's because I, I just have a lot of time. And I want to say that I'm married. The, your disappointment is going to be that nobody living can show you a connection with a single pharaoh and a Joseph because there's no relationship at all except Jewish mythology. Even a rabbi that the Jews that started cannot tie you up with a pharaoh name that we could even go to. The, worse yet, there's no Moses in Egyptian history record. None. There's no record of Abraham here. No record at all. And when you talk about the Jews and the pyramids, the pyramids were all built before the first Jew Abraham was born. That's Jewish mythology. No record at all. No guide you can talk to can show you, carry you any place and show you the information you need. No, no papyri in a museum, no nothing can give you the information. That's what's sad, that's what I'm talking about is the sadness is that Jewish propaganda that we were tied to in our birth don't exist. You know this uh, Pharaoh I asked you about, uh, there, there has to, what well, I, I want to do is relate some scriptures with some Egyptian Oh yes, I could, sure, I'll do that, yes. Tihaka, you know, T to yeah, Tihaka for example, okay. Tihaka would be the 27th dynasty, 24th dynasty, 714. Look at the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, where Isaiah is asking the Jewish uh, army to send uh, uh, to, to Ethiopia for help from the Ethiopians. And that will be when the, Pers the Assyrians with Ashurban Napinal was uh, trying to destroy uh, uh, Israel. But that's modern history. That's just yesterday. You want you well that's the Pharaoh. Tihaka is a Pharaoh. Tihaka is at the time when Ethiopia ruled Egypt. 
See, the pharaohs are different time. You got fa different pharaohs. Uh, but we have to be sharp. There was a time when foreign people came and conquered Europe and, I mean, e Egypt and decided they're going to be the pharaoh. For instance, the Hyksos. Then a time when the, the Assyrians came, conquered, and they said they're the pharaohs. A time when the Persians conquered, they said they're the pharaohs. The Greek conquered in, in that order, and they said the pharaohs. And then the Romans, being the last, conquered, and they said they're the pharaohs. So I'm saying to you is that the time that you're relating your biblical chronology is a myth in some cases. It is a bunch of lies in some cases. Don't exist. It's Hebrew mythology. And then there's a lot of truth. What we, what we get caught up in is every T, every dot, every I is the word of God. No, it's the word of man. Man wrote it. Uh, when you say King James Version, it is Sir Francis Bacon and all those other men who wrote for James wrote it. And you can't cut it. If you take the Hebrew fellows that they are, they are Sanhedrin, writing in 700 BC. They're the ones that write a story with the beginning. What did the Jews